All right, I think we can get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bay Area Robotics Symposium 2018 edition. First of all, I would like to thank the sponsors, the two gold sponsors, Huawei and Intuitive Surgical, the silver sponsors, Anki, Bosch, Neuro, Waymo, and Zoops, and the bronze sponsors, Google, Lyft, uh, and uh, TRI. So in terms of logistics, uh, as far as the Wi-Fi network is concerned, there is a public network, so just uh, log in in the Stanford Visitor Network, no password required, and you'll be able to browse the internet. Uh, for those of you that are students are going to have uh, posters, just to drop off your poster at the registration booth, we'll set it up for you. In particular, the numbers in the schedule denote your presentation order and your poster number. So the schedule is quite packed, so I ask all the speakers to be very careful with the uh, time. In particular, we're going to have uh, four faculty and industry talk sessions two spotlight uh, sessions uh, for the students, two breaks, and uh, one uh, keynote uh, uh, session where we'll have uh, two talks this year, one from Chris Manning and the second one for, from Justice uh, Queller. In terms of registration, as usual, the bars sold out uh, pretty quickly. Uh, the event capacity was uh, 400. This year, interestingly, we had an almost 50-50 split between the students and the non-students. In previous editions, uh, students were the majority. In terms of affiliations, about a, a quarter from uh, Stanford, a quarter from Berkeley, and the rest from uh, other academic institutions or industry. I'm the chair of BARS this year. I'd like to thank Anka, who is the co-chair, taking care of uh, coordinating people on the Berkeley side. Mark at Berkeley and Dorsa here at uh, Stanford. And of course, uh, the people that really made this happen are two students, Erdem in the Dorsa's group and uh, Joe Lorenzetti in my research group. <laughs> Thank you guys. So here at the Hoover Institution, we are at the heart of the Stanford uh, campus. So there are a number of dining options around us. Uh, for example, there are two cafeterias. One is Olive's Cafe, the other one is Cooper Cafe. However, at lunchtime, they can get quite crowded. So in case you may want to go to Trisidar, where there are a number of uh, dining uh, options. All right, so I think we're ready for our first talk from Ron. Thank you. Ah, so good morning, everyone. I'd like to oh, make sure it's there. Okay. Uh, thank the organizers very much for accommodating me. And there we go. Great. So I'd like to give you a, a brief update on the work we've been doing at uh, at uh, Berkeley on our uh, small robots, uh, mainly in legged legged locomotion. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce just a. I would say it's an act, a robot that's in the very early stages. What we're looking at is uh, electrostatic actuation, where uh, by using a special electrode configuration where the actuator is repulsive, we think that offers some interesting possibilities for uh, being able to scale, being able to uh, package uh, many, many layers of actuation to get a, a very uh, reasonable stroke. And the idea here is because the actuator is repulsive, you don't have the problems. You typically have an electrostatic actuator of uh, adhesion. Now, I should say that the, uh, the forces to start with are pretty uh, modest. Uh, however, this is made in a, a very simple fashion just with uh, a thin film uh, printed circuit board material. So we have a repulsive actuator and our first robot, you can see here, we can just take the actuator and put some uh, legs on it and I'd say it's just barely a robot. It's got an external, external power source. You can see just a little bit of uh, wiggling there, but you put it on the ground and you put some anisotropic friction on it and we can claim it takes, uh, takes a few steps. So this is, I, I'm, a, I'm optimistic about this. If you look back at any of our robots, like when they first take their steps, 10 years ago that it you know it takes a while for them to start uh, running up. But this is a very lightweight robot at about a tenth of a gram, which we think would be actually very interesting for um, combining with adhesive and claw materials because the, the weight is, is so low. Great. So we'll talk about uh, maneuverability. 
very uh, interested in looking at all sorts of ways we can uh, maneuver on materials other than uh, simple carpet. So we want to get our small robots out in the world working on uh, rough, rough terrain, loose, loose rocks, etc. And we have a minimally actuated robot, if you're not familiar with it. This is the uh, Velociroach. It has just two motors, so it's very much uh, under-actuated. So the steering on it is a bit of a challenge. Uh, we've done some uh, work recently with my colleague, uh, uh, Sergey Levine, and this is with uh, Anusha uh, Nagavandi. So doing some reinforcement learning. So we can uh, run the robot on a, a variety of terrains, uh, basically uh, build up a dynamic model and use a short order prediction with the model prediction control and choose the best path. For comparison, we've been comparing this to what we call differential drive, which is a very primitive steering method where you just take one side of the robot and have it go faster than the other to turn. And I'll show that a little bit later uh, in some other, uh, other um, comparisons as well. So here are the uh, four examples. So you can see they're little, little small. So the robot is running on those terrains, and the metric we're using is how well it can follow a, a desired path. Uh, those, those borders there are supposed to stay within those paths. And you can, do, you can see the paper if you want details, but we've got a, a pretty good improvement you can see here from the, uh, contr the, um, sort of the, the control case of differential drive, and here's the cost using a learning. And this works well on a variety of, uh, of materials. So we're, we're optimistic about it. We, it's one of these learning things where we don't know exactly what it's doing, but it's doing something worthwhile. Um, We've been looking at uh, tails for, for a number of years now. Uh, our earlier work, just uh, in uh, 2017, was handling the problem of what do you do when your robot tips over? So tail works really well for that. There's other methods of reorienting. If you have lots of degrees of freedoms in your legs, you can just uh, invert uh, using that. But that's going to be a complicated motion. Here, we add just one extra actuator, and we can uh, invert. So. Since we have a minimally actuated robot, it seems like we should try to use every actuator we have to our advantage. So why can't we use that tail for not just roll control, but why not for yaw control for steering? And that's what we can do. So on the left, you can see the differential drive, which is not so bad on carpet. It's actually this plot here is showing some uh, small turning radii. Uh, but we can also just use the tail as a rudder. So have the tail drag on the ground. And you can see that. Start to go back. Go one. Should be running. Go one back. Okay. Well, that one's not running, but yeah, here's the tail drag. You get actually a decent control, decent reliability. This is with a closed loop control. There's a gyro on board, so you can control the steering by. Uh, controlling the rudder force as it's contacting the ground. The turning radius is not quite as tight as you get with the differential drive, uh, but it's, you know, it'd be another mode. It's not, it may be in many cases, depending on the surface, where tail drag provides a, a good way of turning. Another mode using the same, uh, the same actuator is a bit more, a bit more exciting. As we're running along, we can whack the tail into the ground and cause a combination of pitch and roll, which will lead to turns. This is going to give rise to more of a psychotic uh, type turn uh, rather than continuous turns. Again, it may depend on the surface where you'd like to use that type of turn. So you can see it, it triggering uh, turning events. Uh, the basic control is just it's, uh, waiting until the uh, error accumulates past a certain threshold and then does a saccade to do a, a rapid turn. Okay. So I presented uh, last time at uh, BARS We've been working on the jumping robot we call Salto. And so we've made some uh, pretty interesting progress on that uh, towards really being able to uh, precisely hit target locations. Previously, we are basically using the Raybird controller, which is good for following paths in general, but a little bit uh, difficult to hit particular target points. And this is the, um, the basic idea where we're heading. We want to be able to eventually jump from tree to tree or uh, do jumping between rocks. Um, so to do this, we need to have a, uh, an accurate uh, landing location. So this is Salto, if you haven't seen this before, one uh, main drive motor with a series elastic actuator and an eight bar linkage gives a straight line motion. 
uh, weighs about 100 grams, and it has uh, two thrusters, aerodynamic for controlling the yaw and roll, and a uh, tail for controlling pitch. Let's see that go. Okay. So this is using a deadbeat control. So you can see here's the, the robot down here, and it's given some target locations. And currently this is running <coughs> Uh, this is running in a motion capture space, so we <coughs> have local onboard uh, control from the gyro, but it's using the global uh, position estimation from the motion capture system. And so stay tuned for next year if a paper gets in, we have uh, it running outdoors without motion captures. It'll be interesting to see. So it's got a circular error probability, something about a radius of about 30 centimeters, so the chair is um, about, uh, about the size it can hit uh, reliably. We want to get a little bit more uh, into outdoor environments, we want to get from tree to tree. So let me just skip to our claw. And we have yet to integrate onto the robot, but we have a self-engaging claw with nasty spines on it designed to dig into bark. And I'll just show you um, how that looks. So here's landing on a very steep inclined surface. And just because of the balance of the mechanism and the engage self-engagement of the foot, it does a stable jump on a very steep uh, slope. If you go outside that range, you go to, to a, a higher angle, you can see it just, just slips out. So it goes up to 60 degrees, which is a pretty good engagement with the surface. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank all of my uh, wonderful students and thank you very much for your attention. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to take questions while the next speaker sets up. So we're going to invite David to come to the podium. Questions for Ron? When you ask questions, we need you to go to the microphone. I'm so sorry because this is live stream, so we want people to actually hear what you're asking. When you're learning dynamics models for the Velociroach, how do you model the degrees of freedom in the environment? Uh, so the, the only degree of freedom in the environment is a planar surface, and uh, it will do it actually a different learning. So if it's running on gravel, it'll come up with a, a slightly different dynamic model than running on, running on styrofoam. So it just kind of, it, it learns based on the in, in environment. It's also got, I didn't mention, it has a, a camera on there, so you can kind of condition things based on what the, Im what the image is. And then you can kind of, once you've learned all of the different terrains, the ca camera will allow you to kind of pick, the, pick a terrain that's closest to what you've learned. Okay, let's thank Ron one more time. Thanks, Our next speaker is David Lentig from Stanford. Hey, hello. Um, so my students are going to present our latest advances in uh, aerial robotics. Uh, Laura Matloff, Eric Chang, go see their posters. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the inspiration we're getting from looking at how birds fly to develop these robots. I'm going to show you some of our latest uh, findings. Um, so we're going to look at the evolution of slow foraging flight and neotropical birds and bats. Uh, generalist birds like this parrotlet here uh, can do bimodal locomotion in trees. How does that work? Um, you have hummingbirds that can hover in place better than any of our uh, bio-inspired robots and much longer than any of our helicopters. How do they do this? And then even nectar bats can do this. So <clears throat> evolution has found several solutions for uh, flying very slowly in complex environments, and we're trying to figure out how that works. Uh, the questions I have is how do generalist birds perform slow foraging flights? And also, how do hummingbirds and nectar bats forage on the wing? Um, and so the way we study this is actually with birds in the lab, so, such as this parrotlet, we can point anywhere, um, and then the bird will actually fly over by itself towards us. And the question is, how is body weight supported during the wing beat? This is actually something that has never been measured directly uh, for any flying animal. So, uh, well, when the bird flies over, we actually treat it a single seat, a single metal seat. Here it goes. So it's probably the cheapest thing at Stanford. <laughs> so uh, the way you classically measure these things is you go for fluid mechanics. You measure the flow field around the animal. Uh, and you've learned this probably uh, when you did fluid mechanics yourself. It's the intro course. You do a control volume. And basically, we have to know uh, fluid properties at all edges of the control volume 
but if you go into the professor's lab, for example, my lab, we use a $600,000 system or $400,000 system, we can only measure this side. So people cannot get the flow fields everywhere. And another problem is turbulence. You can't resolve the turbulence very well. So the measurements are not precise and the calculations sort of fail because of that reason. Uh, I boxed this problem in my lab. Basically, uh, I literally boxed it. If we make all boundary conditions a solid wall, we know the velocity there and these uh, equations to actually become much simpler. The most complex terms related to turbulence drop out that are hard to uh, measure. And instead, we only have to integrate the pressure and shear stress field on this boundary. That is fluctuating due to turbulence, but we can do this uh, with super precision because it's a solid surface. Um, and then we only have to attach it with load cells on all sides, and we can measure the reaction forces, uh, Newton's third law. Okay, so how do we build this? Basically, we built the first versions with two carbon fiber plates. This is basically an aerospace wing structure, very high natural frequencies. Um, and then the bird exerts his pressure field uh, to fly, and we are actually integrating this. Um, and the, the other thing that we measure is actually the forces exerted during takeoff and landing. So we have a complete momentum transfer. Um, we're, I'm showing you that I don't have the side walls here. We actually check that. It doesn't make a difference in this setup because of the walls being very far away and because we measure other properties, which is really convenient. Here are the results. Um, during takeoff, we measure leg impulse. Then during flight, wing impulse using this new device, an aerodynamic force platform, first of its kind, and then leg impulse during landing. And so if the complete momentum transfer, we get the full uh, the body weight fully reserved. A result, what you can see is that when the bird is flying during the downstroke, it supports twice its body weight. During the upstroke, it's actually in free fall. No weight support right there. And you can see the ground reaction forces again. Um, what that looks like in practice, this is takeoff, so horizontal and vertical forces. This is vertical weight support. Um, we can look at the downstroke, twice the weight support, upstroke, no weight support, bounce, no weight support, free fall, and so on till landing. Um, then we can make a model of uh, this as a long jump plus flapping flight, very much like by modal locomotion of an aerial robot wanting to fly in a tree. We include, uh, include long jump energy, uh, induced power, profile power, climb power, inertial power, and if you add all this up, we can actually look at the minima for mechanical energy required as a function of takeoff angle, and it turns out that these birds select angles that minimize this. And the reason why that makes sense is because they're sort of in a foraging paradigm. They're flying towards us, they're not stressed, they're going for food, they're trying to do this as energetically efficient as possible and gives new ideas for robots. When we actually reduce the distance, then these birds did something really interesting. They made a long jump and actually put in a single wing beat. It was a really flimsy wing beat, we call it a proto wing beat. It only gives a little bit of impulse. Why would you do that? Well, um, if we now look at like our models, and try to understand that and includes uh, also proto birds, so flying dinosaurs in the arboreal environment, it turns out that if you have a long jump uh, and instead of like putting all your, um, uh, your impulse in uh, vertical, but put it forward so you get forward speed and put this tiny proto wing beat to just uh, be a little bit more longer airborne, you get further. So you can increase the long jump substantially and it becomes better and steeper as you become heavier. So, what we learned is generalists select takeoff angles that minimize energy, proto wing beats extend long jump ranges in trees. Uh, now let's look at these hummingbirds and bats. My student Rivers Ingersoll, previous work by Diana Chin, uh, went to Costa Rica, studied 17 hummingbird species, three bat species, including two nectar bats. And these are the first field recordings uh, for these animals. And we can look at their weight support in flight. And it turns out they all do it the same. All these hummingbirds have a very similar upstroke, meaning uh, they support their upstroke up to 25%, uh, their body weight up to 25% during the upstroke across all these sizes. Here's everything put together. And it's very different from this generalist bird that I just showed that doesn't have weight support on the upstroke. So hummingbirds adapt it, and this is what makes them uh, hover more effectively. Then we looked at bats, um, nectar bats, uh, one fruit bat and another nectar bat. And what we found is that they are actually much less effective at generating um, force during the upstroke, but they can hover especially the nectar bats can hover. So how do they do this? Why can they get away with this while not having this adaptation that hummingbirds have? Uh, well, for this again, it's helpful to look at models, like look at the induced power that it costs to hover. Um, and so, so here you see the result, basically the upstroke that's right here. Uh, you see that actually the bat doesn't generate a lot of weight support. Um, 
So how does it deal with that? Because that costs power. Uh, you can see that here, this is the temporal correction factor. It costs a lot of extra power because it doesn't generate trust on the upstroke. Um, but it makes up by having very large floppy wings, much larger in radii. Uh, so if you look at a disk loading weight divided by the disk area, um, then for the hummingbird, and therefore they actually require the same amount of power per uh, kilogram body weight. So that's how they adapt it, floppy wings. Then we looked at the nectar uh, bats versus fruit bats. We actually found that the nectar bats generate more upstroke weight support than the fruit bat. How do they do that? Well, it turned out actually, if you look at the upstroke angle of attack, that like hummingbirds, they twist their wing more on the upstroke to actually make their wing effective for generating vertical force. So body weight support, they're really in between the uh, fruit bat here are the nectar bats and there are the hummingbirds, so they adapt it. Okay, so uh, what did we learn? Basically, bats make up for the inactive upstroke with larger wings, and nectar bat upstrokes are more active by inverting the wings more like hummingbirds. Uh, so that's how we understand the evolution of for foraging, slow foraging flight in new tropical birds. Um, okay, <laughs> uh, over my time, but I want to show quickly that we can also now measure the horizontal forces. So trust and drag uh, for the first time. Um, this also works for aerial robots, so you could measure what aerial robots do. We also have this now in 3D, and it can also work in water and on the water surface, and we're actually working now on the Basil Specific setup. And with that, I want to thank all my students, Diane Chin, River Zingasol, Ben H Hightower, who worked on this stuff, uh, and sponsors, and you. Thank you. Can we have Hannah set up? And is there a question? Quick question for David. Just make sure you're going once, going twice. All right, our next speaker, thank you, David. Our next speaker is Hannah Stewart from UC Berkeley. Thank you, Aka, and thank you for all the organizers who put this together. Um, this event is really important, I think, for the Bay Area and our robotics community. Um, so, my name is Hannah Stewart. I'm an assistant professor at UC Berkeley in the mechanical engineering department. I started the position in January. So, this talk is largely going to focus on sort of my background and my thoughts on robot hands and manipulation. Um, and then I'm going to touch upon some of the newer efforts that we have going and focus on some of the posters that our lab is going to be presenting today. So, Underactuated hands are a really useful solution for robots that need to do manipulation in highly unstructured, unpredictable environments. And it's because they have a degree of compliance that allows them to passively react to unexpected circumstances like impacts. Um, there's a wide variety of options out there, and, and Mark Kakowski put together this, um, this uh, scale. And, and essentially, there's a wide variety of hands. They can be either very compliant or more um, precise and firm. But there's another observation that we need to make for robots when they're applied in the field. Let's take the ocean, for example, which is very unstructured and just a really challenging place. Um, there tends to be this bifurcation of solutions to extremely soft and compliant or much more reinforced and hard, which leaves a gap. So these hands that are sort of maximizing robustness sacrifice either a lot of compliance or a lot of firmness. So that's really where my prior work lies, is trying to create a compliant, underactuated hand that is able to pour, perform both very soft tasks and very precise tasks. So underactuated hands are really dependent upon the system's compliance as well as the contact conditions. And this is because your underactuation makes you susceptible to the forces that are applied from the environment onto the hand. And so I'm gonna quickly talk about a dual stiffness winch that allows um, the Ocean One hand to change its load sharing between fingers, which is a way that we can change compliance, as well as our ability to change contact conditions actively and directly with suction flow underwater. And while designing passive mechanisms often can feel like um, a limitation to underactuated hands because they are so task specific, we can also think of our sensitivity to compliance and contact conditions as a great design opportunity because our sensitivity to these things means that very simple mechanisms that change compliance or contact conditions in meaningful ways can adjust the behavior significantly. 
So uh, the act of selection of compliance in the Ocean One hand, uh, it really has to do with this box down here. It's these springs that are pulling each of the tendons that drives each finger uh, in parallel. And the mechanism actually has these springs inside. Uh, they're torsional springs, and when they're contracted in one direction, the diameter squeezes. And if they're moved in the other direction, the diameter increases. And we can use this geometry tra uh, change to constrain the motion such that sometimes the spring will be soft and sometimes it will be stiff. And uh, I'm not going to go too much into this, but the direction that you basically rotate the transmission will change, whether it starts very soft or starts very stiff. And if you're interested, there's a paper in, uh, in IJRR about this. And when it was applied to the Ocean One robot, which was, uh, uh, so I did my thesis at Stanford, it was directed by Osama Khatib. Um, when we applied it in the field, we found it to be really important to have both capabilities. Because we made impacts with the environment, because it's really hard to um, control the robot when there's a lot of uncertainty, but then we want to be able to pick up heavy objects and transition into a stiffer mode. So we also explored how to update and change our contact conditions actively underwater. So here we've added suction flow to the fingertips of this underwater hand. Um, and you can see that suction flow makes it uh, convenient to pitch a very small object. It is influencing where contact is likely to occur. So now we don't have to fish around in the tank for the small object, it comes to us. This is a bit of a bio-inspired idea. Suction feeding is ubiquitous in the ocean underwater. Basically all fish do it. It's not a mechanism that's very um, common on land, and it has to do with being in a denser fluid. But it doesn't just help with very small objects. You actually are changing the almost the dampening that's happening at the fingertip, such that an object will settle onto it in a very dynamic way, so that we can pinch onto um, larger objects. And in fact, we found that very light suction forces, about one newton, can help you improve your grasp region up to objects that are one kilogram in mass. So a very small change making a really big difference. And then one important thing here I want to point out is that where um, you know, the robot's uncertainty and error in grasping could be combated by better localization, better control algorithms, but it can also similarly be combated by smart mechanical design. And so I really think that AI and EI, or embodied intelligence, needs to work together to make real robots um, work in the real world. And then finally, you can, um, you can eject flow and decrease your coefficient of friction and add um, uh, ejection forces in order to Im improve or change your, um, your ability to transition from a pinch to a grasp. Uh, this is a uh, paper in press with the um, uh, IEEE transactions on robotics, so hopefully you can read more about it soon. All right, so now I want to transition into the new lab I'm, I'm starting to build at Berkeley. It's called the Embodied Dexterity Group. I'm hoping it gets known as EDGE. Um, and it's really um, trying to, to create new electromechanical systems to enable really uh, robust interaction in challenging environments. Um, so similarly, looking at how we design compliance and contact conditions um, for unexpected circumstances. Um, and the lab has grown very quickly. Uh, I've got four graduate students already, um, two of which are going to be um, presenting posters and a couple undergraduates as well. So I'm going to highlight the poster presentations. The first one is going to be presented by Michael Abbott and Dominic Melville, and it's really an extension of the suction flow work. Um, here I'm going to show a maneuver of a fingertip against a flat surface. The red line is showing a measure of flow rate. So as this fingertip comes into a surface, it's going to clog and then it's going to unclog. And then the blue line is showing the angle between the fingertip and the surface. So as the finger comes in and curls up and then down and then comes off, you can see that there's a correlation between the angle and the suction flow rate. But the really interesting thing is that this is a much more complicated signal than that. It's a simple sensor, but a complicated signal. Um, and you see these higher frequency pieces of information, and if you change the environment, the meaning also changes. So it's a really um, interesting area for, for research. And then the other one is focusing now not only on manipulating tools and artifacts like the Ocean One project, but actually handling and manipulating the substrate. And under the water, um, you have a lot of coral reefs and high, uh, hydrothermal vents, which tend to be really brittle. 
which has its own very interesting challenges. So definitely talk to them in their posters. Now, all of my previous work has had a clear application in remote exploration in the ocean, but I'm really hoping to expand beyond this because I think the implications of smart mechanical design for robust manipulation can have really wide, vast implications for many different, um, many different um, locations. And in particular, I wanted to highlight home assistance. So I have a lot of interest in applying sort of the fundamentals of robotics manipulation research to new assistive devices. Um, I'm teaching a class. This is my first effort trying to get into this application area. So I just wanted to mention it in case there's anybody else here who's also thinking about these things. Um, with the help of my um, GSI, Monica Lee, uh, we developed the Ocean One Finger develop, uh, Development Kit, and um, hopefully it will be open and available in the future. Um, also, one last pitch. Uh, there was a workshop that I co-hosted at IROS 2018, and based on the results, we uh, were inspired to create a new uh, frontiers uh, in robotics and AI research topic. And even if you didn't go to the workshop, you're still welcome to um, apply. And this is really focused on connecting machine design with sensitivity and AI in the future. Question for Hannah? No one wants to ask questions because you have to go to the mic, I know. You can make the effort <laughs> to go to the microphone. Going once, going twice. I know there are people doing robot hands here. Can, no, no question. Um, can I take the opportunity to ask Mark and also Jonathan, especially the next speakers, to come over on this left side? Uh, and with that, let's thank Hannah one more time. And our next speaker, thank you, Hannah. Our next speaker is Marco Pavone. Don't stand. Thank you, Anka. All right, so in this talk, I'm going to give you an overview of our work on interactive decision making for autonomous vehicles. So here we see a typical scenario where a vehicle, the black vehicle, is trying to merge onto a highway. And despite the fact that the overall goal of the uh, black vehicle is clear to anyone on the road, there is a lot of uncertainty in the outcome of the interaction, which depends on a complex and possibly quite aggressive uh, negotiation especially in Italy, I guess. In general, this video showcases how interactions on the road are really an exercise in negotiation. An autonomous vehicle should be able to perform such negotiations for safe and efficient driving. In other words, autonomous systems should be able to perform a proactive decision making, as I call it, which refers to the capability of proactively interact with other agents to infer their intents, while concurrently exploiting this information to take actions that account for possible agent, uh, agent responses. The first step to enable proactive decision making is intent prediction. And to infer human intent, typical approaches like for example, inverse reinforcement learning, uh, approaches that are referred to as ontological, postulate some structure on uh, the human decision making process. For example, in terms of an optimization of uh, a cost function. But this postulated structure is uh, sometimes, sometimes difficult to reconcile uh, with how human drivers actually operate. In particular, humans are uh, neither cooperative nor adversarial, and such a fuzziness of behavior is difficult to capture with uh, um, an ont ontological approach that is rooted in game theory. We've thus investigated whether, given enough data, we can reason about the relative likelihood of human actions and responses uh, without reasoning on how human makes uh, their own decisions. Specifically, we have uh, developed uh, a general model of uh, human action and distributions that uh, given an interaction history and a candidate robot future trajectory predicts possible uh, human responses. And we use a conditional variational autoencoder network to um, learn such a distribution. Conditions in the past allow us to predict things like, for example, alertness or aggressiveness of a human, and conditioning on the future allow us to capture the interactive aspect of an interaction. 
So we use this prediction model as the base for policy construction. construction. In actuality, we look at uh, 4,000 uh, motion primitives for the robot vehicles, and we sample 100,000 roughly possible action responses. More or less uh, once have more or less at a uh, three hertz uh, frequency. We score the best action sequence, we execute the first chunk of it, and then we recompute in a receiving horizon fashion. So here on the right hand side, I'm uh, showing some uh, human in the loop tests where the white car is the robot car and the blue car is the human driven uh, vehicle. On the right hand side, you can see predictions from the conditional moderation autoencoder. Let me just see why. Yeah. Uh, for a given uh, robot trajectory. So here you see how some interesting behavior emerges. Like for example, the uh, robot vehicle tries to nudge a little bit on the other lane in order to disambiguate the intent of, of the human operated vehicle. This is great until disaster happens. In particular, probabilistic predictions are still uh, guesses and sometimes we get it wrong. Particularly it might happens really that uh, a human car defies our expectations and swerves into us. More generally, probabilistic planning, even with fairly sophisticated models, can lead to unsafe behaviors for three main reasons. Probabilistic guesses are probabilistic, so we can get it wrong. But additionally, collision avoidance, at least at the level of probabilistic decision making, is captured uh, according to a penalty function in an aggregate cost function. And this can cause some uh, conflicting objectives. And third, replanning at three hertz is ultimately too slow for, uh, in order to ensure safety. This motiv motivates the addition of a lower level safety controller, which in a way acts as the last line of defense. But the key challenge is how to glue the low level safety controller with the higher level stochastic planner in a way that they do not fight with each other. And this is uh, um, an aspect that is often overlooked uh, in the literature. In our work to account for interactions even at the controller level, we harness the tools of uh, hamilton jacobi uh, reachability. In particular, we focus on backward reachability, which entails backward propagating the dynamics by accounting for the closed loop interaction between the human vehicle and the robot vehicle. The end result is the so-called backward reachability set, which essentially encodes the idea that you don't want to put yourself uh, in a state from which you cannot recover from despite your best uh, uh, efforts. In particular, the backward reachable set is defined as a set of avoid states for which there exists strategy for the human that for all inputs of the robot will lead to collisions. And this set can be computed by solving a PDE whose solution is a value function P that gives the backward reachable set as its zero sublevel set. So then the optimal avoidance controller is the controller that uh, um, uh, ensures the uh, quickest increase in the value function. And the typical uh, approaches that uh, use backward reachability entail the switching to such an optimal controller when near the boundary of the backward reachable set. But this can give rise to fairly aggressive maneuvers. So here the green is the human car, red is the robot operated vehicle. Uh, the robot is safe in this case, but actually had to stop in an emergency lane. And uh, this is really too aggressive. In interactive scenario where we want to carefully nudge in the other lane, we would like to have something that is more minimally uh, invasive. So the key idea is that uh, rather than switching to the optimal avoidance controller, we actually optimize and reason in terms of safety preserving controls. The safety preserving controls is the set of uh, controls that ensure that the value function is non-decreasing. Uh, this set is usually quite complex and leads to non-convex optimization problems, thus to enable computation at 100 hertz, we use a linearized version of this set. So the uh, end result is a low level tracking controller that is an MPC controller, which is quite standard. We try to optimize control effort and uh, tracking error subject to linearized dynamics, uh, stable handling envelope constraints, control constraints, and the critical addition of an instantaneous interaction safety constraint, where, which promotes safety in the sense of backward reachability. So the overall decision making and control stack entails a high level decision making modules that produces uh, a nominal trajectories by using uh, uh, human predictions computing through the conditional variation autoencoder, a reachability cache that captures the notion of uh, unsafe states, meaning states we cannot recover from even uh, if we do our best effort. This is something that is computed offline. And then a low level MPC controller 
that executes uh, controls that minimally deviates from the planar desired trajectory uh, when the state approaches the um, avoid uh, set. So we tested this idea on uh, X1, an experimental full-scale self-driving car at the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. The role of the human-operated vehicle is represented by an RC car for obvious safety reasons. And we stress tested this approach in a variety of a tricky interactive scenarios. So for example, here you saw how the RC car swerved into us, defying our uh, expectations. So several tests reported in a paper that uh, uh, has been presented this week at Pfizer show how this approach can ensure safety even in a tricky uh, interactive uh, um, situation without unduly impacting performance. So the takeaway is how learning explicit sampleable distribution of action responses allows for rapid uh, uh, trajectory uh, planning without the need of making any structural assumptions on how humans make decisions. However, probabilistic planning might lead to unsafe behaviors. And to address this challenge, we show how safety can actually be imposed as a hard constraint through the tools of backward reachability analysis while minimally impacting the performance of the higher level probabilistic planning framework. There are a number of exciting future directions in this area, for example, the, uh, scaling up to multiple agents and considering more complicated uh, constraints beyond, beyond collision avoidance. And finally, considering uh, uh, other classes of human robot interaction applications where safety is critical. Question for Marco. I'll ask a question, Marco, if yeah. you don't mind. Um, this is about the conditional variation order in Fodor work. Yeah. Um, sometimes when you try to fit a black box policy to a human, one thing that we found is that you suffer from covariate shift, right? Yeah. So you see some data, basically, of human-human driving, then you fit a model, then you plan with it on your car, it exposes the human to new kinds of actions that no other human has taken, and you don't have good predictive power. So I yeah. wanted to ask you if you've seen this in your experiments at all, and if there's something that you've done about it. So, a little bit, but first of all, we do not, split, we do not fit a, a policy to a human. We use the condition variation out and further only as a module for a human intent prediction. For a policy construction, actually we use uh, more classical tools from decision making, essential approximate dynamic programming. Second of all, in any case, it's true that uh, in one way or another, your predictions can be wrong. That's what motivated us to uh, add uh, such a, a lower level controller but in a careful way so that it's minimally invasive. As I said before, usually low-level collision avoidance tends to fight with the higher-level decision-making planning, and the challenge here was to find a principled way to glue these two layers. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Marco. Our next speaker is Jonathan Sorger, and he comes from Intuitive Surgical. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Sorry to be pushy. I just wanted to try to stay on time. Um, now, most of you know Intuitive. I know some of you have been involved in actually the IP creation. We have a bunch of employees in the room. So I wanted to give a quick update on uh, kind of where we are and some interesting topics in research and development. I received some funding from the NIH, and obviously I'm an employee of the company. So um, it's kind of interesting. The first 15 years of the company, it, it took about 15 years to do the first million procedures with Da Vinci, and we're kind of on track this year to do a million this year, which really blows a lot of us away but obviously quite a few systems in quite a few countries and um, a lot of peer-reviewed publications. The exciting thing, I think, for a lot of us, and I know there are probably 15 or 20 employees in the audience, is we've gone from being a single-platform company to a three-platform company, which most of you may or may not know about. But you know the DaVinci, the XI, kind of the latest um, uh, in, uh, kind of top-end uh, incarnation and the variety of instruments that come with it used in a bunch of different procedures. You know, now we have this SP system, and I'll talk more about it if you don't know about it, where you actually have three instruments plus uh, an articulating endoscope going through a single cannula. And we have a flexible catheter system called the ION, which we just uh, uh, submitted 510K for. So it's kind of a, it's a fun time in the company. But you know, I want to challenge the way if you think about a robot. Uh, we were among the first, not the first, to put a computer in between the surgeon and the patient. And there are a lot of things you can do with that. And that's what I really want to focus the next uh, seven and a half minutes on. So most of our systems are networked. And we think of surgeons as decision makers and actuators and sensors. And so we're obviously trying to augment um, the surgeon's ability to do those things. So we like to think of the future in terms of um, 
being more than just a robot. You know, we have a, a really nice platform out to do a bunch of different types of procedures. But if you look at all the potential for software, uh, for, you know, in the training aspects up in the upper left, let's see if this guy works. So we have a lot of things that we can do to help train surgeons and bring the average surgeon up to a, an expert level, at least in providing uh, additional information for them. Uh, there are things in support and analytics to the hospital, to the OR staff that we can actually do. And then a lot of innovation and immigration in terms of imaging, um, you know, ergonomic uh, advanced instruments and advanced vision. And I'll touch on a few of these things in, in the next few minutes, but I like to think of things in terms of the clinical need and the clinical application. And I was hanging out with a bunch of head and neck surgeons a few, a few weeks ago and we were talking and said, you know what, head and neck surgery, be it robotic uh, assisted, be it open, be it laser assisted, there's still a lot of huge problems that actually, you know, the hemorrhage can kill patients. Uh, positive margins aren't a good thing. And people come away maybe with a cancer-free procedure, but they have severe quality of life and, and nerve injury issues. So if we look at some of these things, I'll touch on surgical navigation um, into the beginning. Uh, you'll say, this isn't head and neck, this is a kidney. Uh, some of you may know Mahdi Azizian. Uh, he did some really wonderful work um, down in Intuitive a few years back with a urologist uh, from Heidelberg, Doug Tigger, where we just tried playing around with how we can augment uh, surgical field guidance. And you know, with CT scans, with MRs, you, ultrasound, you can start doing overlays and present roadmaps to where you know, the surgeon doesn't see things. We tried doing this um, actually a few months ago with some surgeons from Hong Kong, Jason Chan and Raymond Tsang. And here you, know, you can actually see uh, a more difficult situation. I'm not sure if the movie is playing or not, but you see some, uh, anyway, uh, some automatic registration issues uh, going on. So trying to come up with ways to do automatic registration can make the things more difficult. Uh, but ultimately, if you use it during a, a procedure, this is the carotid vessel kind of uh, representation overlaid. It doesn't have to be a, a nice, beautiful rendered version. It could be a B-spine if you want. Um, but trying to give them guidance what they shouldn't hit could be very useful for these, uh, these procedures and avoiding unnecessary hemorrhage if they're dissecting a tumor right up against the carotid. So <clears throat> if we talk a little bit about molecular imaging and some of the things going on at Stanford, positive margins are a huge deal in most of the types of uh, oncologic procedures we deal with. Uh, just in general. And there's a wonderful uh, surgeon over in the uh, cancer center, Evan Rosenthal, who's been really doing some groundbreaking work in this area, hooking up you know, cancer-seeking therapeutics to fluorescent dyes. And you, know, you can actually see in the, in the white light image, there, there's a nodule there, but when you actually take these fluorescent signals and overlay them onto, the, uh, onto what you're looking at, it really can have an impact on kind of just the general situational awareness that surgeons have. And so uh, here's actually an image of a the next planted head and neck cancer of uh, Dr. Rosenthal's on the Da Vinci. So we've integrated this technology and we're working with a lot of partners to try to bring this forward. Nerves, obviously, uh, injured during a lot of different types of procedures. I want to highlight some work of um, some collaborators, Connor Barth and Summer Gibbs up north in, in Oregon, a bit north of the fires now. Um, but you know, you can see the nerve in the upper image and you can see with fluorescence in the bottom image, it kind of pops out. It, it isn't always as easy. And so you can see how this might be incredibly additive to the, uh, the surgical experience in the future, kind of in the next image there. So data analytics, all right, variability in surgery is a huge problem, as, as you may or may not know. You, know, you, get, you get onto a piece of surgical equipment, you do something, uh, you use it, but um, uh, about six years ago, an article in the, the New England Journal came out showing that the bottom quartile of surgeons were responsible for three times more complications and uh, you know, two times increase in, in readmissions. And nowadays, you know, the, the healthcare systems are tracking that and they're starting to ding people on readmission, uh, on re reimbursement rather, if they have readmissions in 30 days. And so we can take a lot of data, you know, big data is obviously huge. You can probably get about a terabyte from a surgical case from one of these Da Vinci systems. And we, you know, we have a, an engineering team in Atlanta that's starting to, to tease these apart. They've, they've done a wonderful job at it. You know, what can we do? How can we improve uh, this variability? And uh, Tony Jark, is, uh, he leads that team in our Atlanta group. Uh, some of you actually have worked with Tony. And Andrew Hung, a urologist at USC, published some interesting paper comparing novices to experts. And they've come up with the, the idea of this report, where you can say, you know, relative to an expert surgeon, uh, you're doing well or you're not doing well. You can see in this example, you know, a, a surgeon isn't using their energy very effectively. You know, a completion time of a task might be okay, but, you know, there are certain things we can add uh, to in terms of the, the mentoring process to help bring them up to a level of an expert. And some of you may have seen this. This is kind of paths of the motion controllers. This was done years ago by a different group, but Andrew and Tony published in a different way in urology, showing experts on the left who are really conserving their hand motions during two specific phases of a, of a prostatectomy. And then a novice obviously is clashing quite a bit. And so you would like to give someone advice, like maybe you should clutch more uh, and watch them and see how they do things. So it, it, this is kind of an eye task chart, but they've come up with a bunch of tasks 
that they deem were mostly statistically significant from instrument path length to number of clutches to efficiency of camera motion. And these are the things that we think are gonna be incredibly important in helping to kind of give the patient who's in the middle of the Midwest at a community hospital the same surgical experience that they can get coming to a world-class uh, hospital like we have here in Palo Alto. So I think a lot of these metrics are gonna be incredibly important. But we have to be careful. I wanna highlight some work that was done here you know, five or six years ago by the wonderful group, uh, the CS group uh, in combination with Google. Uh, a lot of you probably remember this. You know, they took 10 million uh, videos, and you know, images rather, from the YouTube library. And then they fed them into just a bunch of uh, compute cores. And you guys remember what happened? Anyone yell out what they found? What's the most common thing in YouTube? Cats, yeah, it was actually faces. Uh, secondary was cats, right? So it was cat, and you know, they came up with the, uh, they have a wonderful way, and it was actually, here's their cat neuron. So it was, you know, cat was the important thing. But a wonderful way, they actually, the compute, you know, algorithms came up with the concept of a face without being told. So it was really, really an amazing thing. Um, you know, and then they had the gorilla fiasco with the photos thing uh, a few years later. But we have to be careful, you know, with unsupervised learning. You know, we can take the same thing, put a million robotic cases into a compute core and take everything we know about the robot and come up with a statement like this, saying, you know what, at a certain time, we saw you know, uh, certain wavelengths correlated with a poor outcome in terms of hemorrhage. You know, it's, it's amazing, you can do this and you come up with these really wonderful uh, speculations and say, oh look, there's something going wrong there. But if we take very few cases and put it into an expert surgeon, I don't know if you guys know, this surgeon here at, at Stanford, uh, she's done quite more than 20 surgical cases, but you know, she'll put an endoscope in and say, oh, you know what, I see adhesions. This is gonna be a more difficult case. Uh, you know, so it's the same thing that that you know, million cases with an unsupervised learning algorithm came up with something that a, a, pretty, a novice surgeon can even know when they put an endoscope in. So we have to be careful with unsupervised learning techniques. Uh, this is the, the SP system. I won't dwell on it uh, very much. I have a, a less than a minute left, but uh, you know, three uh, instruments coming out with an articulating camera. The system's been in development over 10 years. Uh, it takes us about 10 years to develop a new system we found. And so it's, uh, it's quite interesting. We're learning a lot uh, from having done the first uh, few cases in the last month and producing other subjects here in Cleveland. Um, you know, also exciting is this ion pump form, which has also been in development for over 10 years. It's an electrical catheter uh, for lung biopsies. So we're looking at the MET community for, for lung biopsy. Uh, you know, this, this is something that we think will, um, you know, the team's been working on it for over 10 years as well. Uh, in, very interesting um, kind of fiber optic shapes that's in technology. A lot of interesting things going on. Thanks for your time. Uh, we're now a three-platform company. Many employees are here yeah, throughout the day, so uh, you know, asking questions. And thanks very much for your time. So here I am. Thank you. Questions. I have a microphone now. Yay. Questions. Going once. Going twice. Stunned silence. Okay, I'll ask one. Sure. Um, if you think about injecting more and more autonomy into the Da Vinci system, I was wondering if you think of the essentially being a partner still to a surgeon, so the surgeon is still in the loop. Um, what are the kinds of supporting mechanisms that you think might be the most useful? Can you tell us what parts we should wor worry about automating? Sure. I mean, in terms of autonomy, we're, we're in the center of the self-driving car explosion here other than Detroit. And you know, you look at our office windows and we see Apple cars going by, or presumably they're Apple cars. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of thinking of autonomy as helping give the surgeon more information as opposed to deconstructing the specific task at hand. And so I think a lot of non-contact things that go on. Uh, the XI, for example, we took a lot of data in and if you want to do a, um, a urologic procedure, you'd say where the patient is, you push a button, and the robot self-configures itself for how a certain percent of surgeons actually do that case. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to say autonomy will never be done in my lifetime, but when you go to Aethra and IROS, you see these giant robots doing it. A lot of you are doing the actual automated knot tying. I don't think that's where, what surgeons want. I think they want a better understanding of you know, where they should make cut planes in terms of getting a better surgical outcome. So I think guiding them will be much more important than actually doing the automatic task. That's my own opinion. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Jonathan one more time. <laughs> Next is Mark Mueller from UC Berkeley. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is my first bars. It's like each time I've always missed it somehow, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, happy to tell you a bit about the work we've been doing and what we're currently working on. 
Uh, so we work on aerial robotics, uh, and specifically I want to talk today about efficient and agile aerial robotics. So we're quite interested in thinking about how you know, to operate aerial robotics in challenging environments, and this sort of to motivate this, uh, I have this video that uh, we put together showing you know, some examples of environments that would be very difficult to operate in, uh, including, of course, external disturbances um, from you know, uh, things that are not friendly. So one thing we think about is how do you change your, your designs, how do you change your aerial vehicles to make them more robust, to make them more steady in flight, um, so you can do, of course, more clever control design, but what can you do beyond the control design? And one idea that we were exploring is this uh, concept of having an additional angular momentum attached to an aerial robot. So what you see here is a relatively standard quadcopter, but then you attach a large source of angular momentum to the bottom of this vehicle. And this is somewhat similar to how satellites uh, that are spin-stabilized um, operate. And then what you can do is you can analyze as a function of how much uh, energy or how much speed you allow this wheel to have, um, how sensitive your system is to disturbances. So that's what you're seeing here on this top plot. And we notice that as you have more energy in the wheel, the system is much more robust uh, to external disturbances. And this specific plot shows the um, gain from a torque disturbance acting on the system to a pitch or roll uh, attitude error. In practice, um, you'd like the wheel to spin as fast as possible, but at some point you get a little bit nervous about all this additional energy that you're pumping into the system. Uh, so practically, then you have some engineering constraints that define typically where you, you are. And for this design I'm going to show you now, um, we designed it such that we expect a reduction of about 40% in terms of sensitivity. Uh, we validated this experimentally. So this is a vehicle that weighs about 700 grams. Uh, you see at the bottom here the momentum wheel. Uh, you can see that mouse as well, yes. Uh, you can see the momentum wheel here at the bottom. Uh, and what we have here is we have a protrusion extending from the vehicle. And what we will do is we will hit the vehicle uh, with a certain mass at this protrusion, causing a torque impulse uh, for us to reject. So for a standard vehicle, without the wheel spinning effectively, um, when we hit it with this torque impulse, uh, we see that the vehicle fails. You see exactly what you'd expect. Large impulse causes the vehicle to pitch over, uh, and then it fails to recover. This shows what happens when you have this additional source of angular momentum. So on the left, you have the standard design, and on the right-hand side, you have with the wheel spinning. Um, and we have exactly the same impulse acting on the two systems. So I'm going to hit save. And we note that there's a much reduced uh, response here. And of course, when you look at this in slow motion, you see this sort of precession, much like when you have a rate, uh, you have a gyro uh, top spinning on a table and you bump it, you have this precession. It's very similar behavior. Now, to make this a fair comparison, the controllers were designed that they're allowed to spend, in some sense, an equal amount of uh, actuator commands. So it's not just the one has a stiff control and the other one has a less stiff control. The only design is this dynamics that we change. And what's nice about this approach is you can have this vehicle be relatively rigid in the air by having the wheel spinning. Uh, but if you want to be agile like a normal quadcopter, you can slow this wheel down and just have a standard quadcopter. So you get to sort of dynamically uh, move from a normal agile vehicle to one of these vehicles that's relatively inert in the sky. We're also quite interested in power consumption. Um, so one of the things we're interested in, how do you make these vehicles more efficient? I'm going a bit slower than I expected, so I'm going to jump over this. Um, the power consumption of these vehicles is a very complicated topic. It's a complicated pipeline going from uh, the battery that provides the energy all the way to the air that provides the lift. Uh, but a very rough model is that the power goes like the force to the power one half. Uh, and this is called the actuator disk model. And if you use this, you can argue that uh, a simple mechanical modification that you can make to multi-copters to reduce power consumption is to incline the propellers. And what this does, it gives you a greater yaw authority. Uh, so standard multi-copters have the propellers all parallel to one another. And what's happening here is you're inclining the propellers through some angle. And what this does is at hover with no um, disturbances, you would expect to require one over cosine of the angle more thrust, so more power. But once you have disturbances acting on the vehicle, the energy you require to reject those disturbances goes down. Uh, you can analyze this theoretically, we've done, uh, and if you do this in experiment, you can show a reduction of a few percentage points depending on the magnitude of the disturbance um, in your power consumption in hover. A nice side effect of this is the vehicle actually has more control authority, meaning that it is faster to respond to commands as well. So you actually get nicer trajectory tracking as well as better energy consumption. We're also working on some uh, online adaptations. So as you're flying, for example, carrying packages, um, you want to do this as efficiently as possible, and you don't want to have to model everything and analytically compute optimal uh, trajectories um, based on uh, aerodynamic models. 
So the approach we've been messing around with a little bit is uh, using an extremum seeking control uh, and then using this extremum seeking control to adapt the operating speed of the vehicle in flight. Um, and without going over too much of the details, um, in application what we do is we had the vehicle and then we were carrying different payloads of different sizes. And clearly these payloads have different drag coefficients, so the optimal speed at which you operate will be a function of the payload. But we don't want to have to pre-plan this, so we have this online adaptation. Um, and then, you know, in experiments, what we do is we fly circles. We're doing this in a motion capture space. Um, so we have limited space, so we can't fly straight lines. So we fly these horizontal circles, uh, and the vehicle online adapts its speed to find the optimal um, speed for this power consumption. And when you have the large box, the speed is quite a bit slower than if you have a small box. This is just experiment with a, a small box. Um, a downside with these experiments is that you pay a lot of energy just for the centripetal acceleration as you're flying in a circle. So um, we have to then do a bit of manipulation to extrapolate from these results to what you would get in a straight line. And that's what we're working on at the moment. But it seems that there's a, a few percentage points in doing this cleverly if you have very different payloads that you might be carrying. Um, now some more uh, experimental, or not experimental, some more work that's more in progress. Let's say something that I'm excited about and just wanted to share uh, some initial results. This is working with a colleague who works on multi-phase fluids, and we're interested in vehicles that can operate both in the air and underwater. Um, and what is interesting is that the dynamics of these systems are vastly different once you're underwater and once you're in the air. Of course, totally submerged and totally in the air is relatively straightforward, but where it becomes interesting is at the interface of these two surfaces. And I just want to show you some initial uh, experiments that we did that demonstrate this in action. So this is a vehicle breaching the water surface. Uh, applications for this kind of technology is clear, um, you know, underwater inspection, uh, search and rescue, uh, things like this. So if you have calm water entering the water, it's always easy. Breaching the surface is easy, as we saw before. But this becomes much more interesting when the water is not calm, and this is where we um, are currently looking at the problem. So what happens if you have waves and how do you breach the surface when you have waves? So if the waves are relatively small compared to the size of the propellers, breaching the water is again relatively feasible. But once you have more difficult environments, for example, uh, more complicated sea states, uh, this becomes more difficult. And that's what this last clip here will show. So we see the vehicle breaching the surface, but as it's trying to leave the water, the wave keeps impacting the propeller. So the question here is, how do you design a system that is capable of doing this efficiently, um, that is capable of, sort of uh, estimating the state of the water um, and reliably breaching the surface uh, and coming back up? Uh, and then as I'm running out, I'm just going to show one last thing that we submitted to ICRA this year. This is um, passively morphing vehicles. So the idea is uh, we don't want to have uh, we want to have more interesting dynamics than standard multicopters, but we don't want to make things more complicated, more difficult. So what we did is we had a vehicle that has additional degrees of freedom, but these are unactuated. So these are just passive dynamics, but what this allows you to do is it allows you to fly through very um, complicated environments. So here you see the vehicle flying through, for example, a very small gap. This gap is sized such that you couldn't fly through it uh, in the standard configuration. So only by adding this passive dynamics is this feasible. Um, and I'd love to tell you more about it, but you'll have to come find me afterwards. Um, Nathan, the student working on that, as well as on the momentum wheel, will be presenting. Shang Yu Wu, who's sitting over there, works on the energy geek. He will also be presenting a poster. Um, so with that, thank you. I don't think I've passed some of the time. I will lift the constraint of going to the mic. You don't have to go to the mic anymore. Just raise your hand, and I'll ask Mark to repeat the question. Questions? Once. In terms of the bio-inspiration behind the, the changing during flight, do birds and other animals do this? I've seen birds successfully complete this maneuver and unsuccessfully. Is it something this is ins inspiring the design? Um, so certainly that's, that's where this idea came from. Um, I think the big difference is biological systems tend to have many actuators. So we have many more uh, inputs than you know, what this vehicle does have. But by adding this passive dynamics, you sort of start moving in that direction. And then there's some interesting algorithmic challenges for how do you plan motions, et cetera. But next year, I'll get into that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Our final speaker in the session is Dorsa Sadek from Stanford. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Dorsa. 
And my research is about algorithm design for autonomous systems that interact with people. So I'm very interested when humans and, uh, and robots come together and, and start doing stuff together. So in my lab, we are doing a lot of work in trying to build predictive models of humans and build really good uh, representations of these models when they're interacting with robots. So specifically, we are interested in coordination, collaboration, human-robot teaming. I'm not going to talk about these today, but I'm mentioning these because my student Erdem is going to give a poster on learning uh, preferences of humans, developing some active learning methods for that, and also my students Mangxi and Mene are going to talk about human-robot teaming. I'm also interested in safety and interaction when it comes to navigation. So I've done some work in autonomous driving, and today specifically I want to talk about traffic. So I want to talk about mixed autonomy traffic and why we as roboticists should think about that. So let me just spend the next, yeah, eight minutes talking about this idea of influencing traffic and what we can do about that when we have autonomous cars driving on our shared roads. So before coming to the Bay Area, I used to live in LA, and if any of you know anyone who lives in LA, we love to talk about our roads uh, and our highways, 5, 405, 55, all of the different highways that exist there. And this is actually a video of Thanksgiving traffic a couple of years back uh, from LA. Uh, I don't think I need to motivate it more why traffic is an important problem. It's a very important, challenging, difficult problem that is very expensive. So in 2015, it was around $160 billion in terms of time and fuel. Uh, just per year, just for the US. And this is just increasing every year. So challenging problem, what can we do about traffic? So one might say maybe we want to build more roads. Maybe we can just increase our supplies. Well, that's an OK idea, but the problem is if you want to just build like one mile of freeway, that's about $1 million. So that's a very expensive idea. The other idea that other uh, different governments have been trying out is uh, to, to work with decreasing demand. So what can we do? if we can go about decreasing demand. So one attempt at that is tolling. So I think half of you guys are coming from Berkeley in the morning and you probably experienced this. So this is the Bay Bridge toll uh, station and uh, you can, I think a lot of us agree that this is not really solving the traffic problem yet. And the problem with that is administrating optimal tolls is very challenging. So this is not really solving the traffic problem. Some of the other ideas are some of the things that other governments have been trying out. This is actually interesting. This is from Iran, and this, I grew up in Iran, and this is something I've experienced. Uh, so what they do is they have restricted areas, and then uh, cars with even license plate numbers can only go to the restricted areas on even days, whatever that means. And with odd numbers, you can go in on odd days. And this is actually an example of how that will fail. So what happens is you get to the restricted area, there's a motorcyclist, you pay the motorcyclist, the motorcyclist rides behind you, and the camera doesn't detect your license plate. So just one way of solving it. Another way is just buying more cars. This is what we did. So we would take the Honda on Tuesday, Thursdays, and take the Toyota on, on Wednesdays and Fridays, and that would solve the problem. Uh, so we might say, well, maybe we should just restrict the number of cars people can buy. And actually, like some areas of China, that's actually something that people do, so the government has done. You, uh, they, they only allow limited number of vehicle purchases, and you might imagine this might not work very well in the United States. So none of these really work that well in helping with traffic. So our idea is, how about using autonomous vehicles to help with traffic? They're emerging, they're going to come into our like, roads. So how about using them for this other problem that we have had, which has existed for a while? And of course, you are not the first people who have thought about this. So from a long time ago, people have been thinking about platooning and truck platooning and how that can help with capacity of the roads. More recently, we have seen uh, newer work thinking about smoothing instabilities using autonomous cars and also thinking about ride sharing and mobility on demand. And I think there's a lot of opportunities going into this area of mixed autonomy. So now that I've motivated that, I just want to briefly talk about one of the works that we have done uh, around like thinking about autonomous vehicles and how they can influence some of these societal scale objectives like, like traffic. So specifically, we have two works, uh, two, two recent works from past year, where we have been thinking about autonomous car policies and the specific policies they can take in interaction with human-driven cars and how that can reconfigure the road. How can that, how can that reconfigure the specific uh, road configuration we might be in? Uh, and, and that can actually increase uh, traffic capacity, and we have some theoretical and practical results for that in the CDC work. The main thing I want to talk about is routing. So another cool thing we can do is, if we have autonomous cars, we can actually tell them where to go. We can route them. Uh, and, and that can be quite interesting, because maybe some of them would be altruistic. Maybe some of the autonomous cars would be a little nicer. And the question is, how can we leverage that uh, to help with traffic? So, 
giving an example here. So imagine that you have n parallel roads. We have uh, human-driven cars. Those are the red cars. Let's say that they're selfish. So if they're selfish, they only care about their own delay. And we also have a mixed autonomy situation. So we have autonomous cars. And we're assuming these autonomous cars, some of them are altruistic. And what that means is they're OK with taking a little bit more delay, some, some factor of the human's delay. So under that scenario, the problem we are interested in is a routing problem. And the idea is, what can I, how can I route my autonomous cars to help with capacity of the road or reducing latency? So we think about it from three different perspectives. The first question is, what are some of the emerging behaviors that we get if we have these mixed autonomy situations? And what I mean by that is Nash equilibrium. Like, what are some of the equilibrium we get? So the very interesting thing here is when we have mixed autonomy, when we have mixed population, the Nash equilibrium is not, a, not unique. Uh, if, oh, what happened? Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, and if it is not unique, then there is a question of what is a better one? What is a better Nash equilibria that we would want to, we would want to experience? Uh, so, so we have actually characterized that. And then the final thing that we have been thinking about is yeah, how to use altruism. And then if we bring in altruism, what are some of the equilibria that we get in these situations? Um, planning on not going into details of it, but just one tool that we have been using to give you an idea of how to even approach in any of these problems. The specific tool we are using is this idea of fundamental diagrams and diagram of traffic, which is a very common diagram in traffic literature. And what it does is it's a diagram that connects flow and density. So when we are in free flow, the, that's kind of that part of the diagram, and we get to a critical density, and that's free flow, so cars are driving normally and okay. And then at some point, we are going to get congestion. So, so that's the rest of the diagram, and that's how it represents congestion on roads. There's a parallel to this diagram that thinks about it in the case of latency with respect to flow. So a common existing paradigm in traffic. If you think about mixed autonomy, the only thing that is going to change here is these diagrams are going to get, uh, sorry, are going to get pushed back a little bit. So mixed autonomy and the fact that we have autonomous cars is going to push our critical density just a little bit more. And we model that using this particular critical density uh, formulation. So let me just show you one example, and then after that I can take questions. So imagine you are in the Irvine area. Uh, you're in Tustin, and then you want to go to Irvine Spectrum. If you know the area, you kind of know why you would want to do that. Uh, so you have four parallel roads. Uh, you can take five, you can take uh, 55 and 405, or you can take two residential roads. So this is kind of an example that we have, but we have n parallel roads. Uh, and specifically, what we are looking at is how we can think about Nash equilibrium. So the first video corresponds to, uh, the first video didn't play, corresponds to the Nash one of the Nash equilibria that we would get. So uh, you can see the latency of them. This thing is not working. Uh, and then we also characterize what is a robust best Nash equilibrium, which is a better Nash equilibrium for it. So that's the second video. And finally, the altruism le level that we are allowing is 1.5 times delay of humans. So autonomous cars are okay with taking 1.5 times delay of the humans. And we see more, uh, smaller latency for that scenario. Uh, if you're interested in details of that, we're presenting this at Wayfair this year. I can also take questions. Uh, here's a group. Does anyone have a question? So what is the penetration of uh, autonomous vehicles to have a significant impact on congestion according to your uh, routing policy? Yeah, so, the model, so the model we are using here is autonomous vehicles can have shorter headway in front of them. Uh, so based on that model, the platooning model, we are, we are allowing autonomous vehicles to help with traffic. But there is also the... Uh, so the, it's based on the autonomy level. So everything is a function of alpha, which is the autonomy level. So if you have more autonomy, uh, so, so I, we actually have plots showing that what's the gap between, uh, between uh, capacity for all the different values of autonomy level. All right, let's thank Dorsa one more time. And with that, we're on to the coffee break. Yes, yes, uh, coffee spotlights. break? Spotlights. spotlights. Spotlights, never mind, no coffee break, everyone stay here. So first up we have Intuitive Surgical. All right, so yeah, I'm here to talk about Intuitive, maker of the DaVinci Surgical robot. Uh, if you're not familiar with DaVinci, let me start with a brief history of surgery, so. First we had open surgery, uh, where the surgeon cuts you wide open and reaches right in. Uh, then we had laparoscopic surgery, where they're inserting uh, sort of 
long slender mm -hmm. tools through tiny incisions, but these incisions limit your motion to four degrees of freedom, so you're losing dexterity. Uh, da Vinci, unlike these tools, has a wrist, uh, so you're back to full six degree of freedom motion, but then the question is, how are we gonna control these more complicated instruments? And that's where we're gonna uh, harness the power of robots. Uh, so the tools attached to the robot, the surgeon sits at a console and gets a 3D view of the instrument doing exactly what the surgeon's hands are doing. Uh, this approach can make difficult surgeries easier and make impossible surgeries possible. Prostatectomy is a great example. Uh, there's not really a great uh, laparoscopic approach for prostatectomy, but da Vinci makes it possible, and now 86% of prostatectomies in the US are done using uh, da Vinci. Um, so here's our latest model, uh, three instruments and a camera, uh, 50 instruments to choose from. Uh, it also has cool features like uh, null space motion uh, of the arms and the uh, integration with the table so that as the surgeon tilts the table, the robot actually follows right along with it. Um, here's a new robot, uh, Jonathan showed you a video. Uh, three arms and uh, three instruments and the camera come in through a single one inch incision. Uh, it can also operate through natural orifices like the, the mouth, the anus, or the vagina. Um, here's a robot that we still haven't released. Jonathan showed a video too. This one snakes through passages of the lungs to reach a nodule that might be cancerous and take a biopsy because uh, we're trying to reach smaller nodules than can be reached with current uh, technology because early uh, detection greatly increases the chances of survival. Um, just uh, some numbers real fast. Uh, over 4,500 da Vinci systems in the world, uh, 1 million surgeries a year, and 5 million uh, total da Vinci patients. I actually know several patients in my own life and uh, Given these numbers, chances are pretty good that someone you know has been a patient too. So if that's the kind of impact you want to have, uh, please stop by and talk to us. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sid Askery. I'm with uh, Huawei, uh, the world's largest telecommunication manufacturing uh, equipment manufacturing company. Um, show of hands, how many of you have uh, not heard of us? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so um, I, I wanted to give a brief uh, uh, overview of um, what we do. Um, uh, so the company started in Shenzhen back in the late 80s, in Shenzhen, China, and that's where our headquarters is. Uh, we're about um, 180,000 um, people strong, uh, and uh, about half the company is engaged in R&D. Um, we have uh, 15 R&D centers, um, uh, 15 R&D labs uh, uh, in, around the world. Um, and uh, we're in 80 uh, countries doing research. Um, and um, we essentially build stuff. And that means um, both uh, equipment um, and also um, software and services. Um, so there, we're divided into three uh, major groups. Uh, there is consumer group, there is a carrier product group, and then there is um, what we call enterprise and uh, cloud services. Um, and as you can see, uh, there has been tremendous uh, growth over the past few years, and there's a projection for even uh, more growth uh, over the coming years. Um, so to be specific uh, about the R&D effort, about 15% of our budget last year was uh, given to R&D, which is uh, quite remarkable. And over the past decade, it's about $60 billion. Um, um, and um, that includes uh, 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 quite a bit of effort in science and technology. I'm, I'm running out of time here. Um, so we want to be um, uh, a company that is moving into the future and we're hiring. So we, we, we have uh, uh, openings in robotics, autonomous driving, uh, algorithms and and so on, so it's not just uh, making equipment. Thank you.
So hopefully a lot of you uh, know of us already, but Anki is a consumer robotics company just up the road in San Francisco. And um, probably like many of you, I got into robotics because of variety. I feel like the field is pretty much defined by being multidisciplinary. And Anki takes that really to an extreme. So we have expertise not only in sort of the, the typical fields of computer vision, uh, hardware design, electrical mechanical design, path planning, um, machine learning, et cetera, controls. Um, but we also add to that the critical element of personality and character. Uh, so we use a lot of animation and uh, character exp experts to help bring our robots to life. All of this is then backed by a secure and scalable cloud backend, which we used for we used for over-the-air development, over-the-air deployment, uh, computation, and analytics. Beyond that, we've also mastered the supply chain logistics and manufacturing it takes to actually build these robots and ship them and get them around the world. And from my experience, that is a whole other beast that I think most of us who come from an academic background have no appreciation for. It's really a truly incredible thing to behold. We've been at this for a long time now, and we've shipped over one and a half million robots into people's homes uh, and have several successful product lines. And, wh in, and while we've been doing this, we've actually been building uh, stepping stones of technology to allow us to continue to innovate while also not forgetting the important part of actually making some revenue to sustain our business as we grow. We are excited. We just launched our most recent robot called Vector. Um, he is a completely autonomous, characterful tabletop robot. He uh, has all the stuff I talked about a little bit, mentioned on the last slide. So he does computer vision, he does uh, path planning, he has cloud enabled voice, he has a full emotion system, he runs neural nets on board, he has uh, a whole behavior system, and all of this is running on a little robot that fits in the palm of your hand. So please come by our table and meet Vector and some of the guys who made him. And also we have a talk in uh, the Tech Talks this afternoon about our cloud system. Thanks. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Vincent, and I lead the uh, Google Brain Robotics team uh, at Google. Uh, we have a mission to try and understand what machine learning can do for robotics. It's pretty broad, but we're pretty opinionated about it. Um, we have been working on a variety of uh, different problems. Uh, starting from manipulation and, uh, and grasping. We won a Best Systems Paper Award at CORAL um, this year. We've been working on uh, locomotion and simulation to reality transfer. This is a little robot that's um, actually been trained entirely on simulation using deep reinforcement learning, and that um, is, uh, is actually transferring to the real world. Uh, we've been also working on uh, navigation and planning. This was a Best uh, Paper in Service Robotics at ECRA this year. Uh, try to meshing up, uh, you know, the uh, sort of traditional path planning approaches with reinforcement learning as well. Um, we are starting to work seriously also on uh, uh, teleoperation of robots and looking at what we can do with humans in the loop. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, feel free to talk to me. And uh, I'll be here all day. If you want to reach out and talk, uh, please come and chat with me or send me an email. Thank you. Good morning. So at Zoox, we have designed and engineered the world's first and only ground up level five autonomous vehicle. It has no steering wheel. It's 100% battery electric, it is symmetrical, and it's bi-directional. We're not selling it, you can't buy it. We're gonna operate it in a fleet, so you'll use it like Uber and Lyft, except it's gonna be much nicer, much cleaner, much safer, and you won't have to pay someone else to drive you around. We've also created all of our own software. So here you can see we're actually classifying every single LiDAR point. We can do that for every spin in about seven milliseconds. We're also understanding the entire scene visually. So we can classify every pixel in our camera images, also do that in real time. We do our own mapping, localization, and calibration. Here you can see our 3D map of downtown San Francisco. It's about 500 city blocks and growing quickly. We also have built our own simulator. It's like the matrix for self-driving cars, so everything you see here is simulated data, and we can run our entire AI software stack virtually. Now, we're doing a ton of driving 
in downtown San Francisco, also on freeways. We're driving seven days a week, 16 hours a day in our level three fleet. And you can see some of the driving that we're doing here. So doing daytime, nighttime, fog, rain, uh, really complicated parts of San Francisco that we don't really see other companies driving. So here we have a six-way unprotected intersection with more than 100 dynamic agents that we're tracking in real time. We have to make our way here in an unprotected left. We have to wait for all the cars and we have to wait for all the pedestrians. Super complicated. I don't really like driving this myself, but our robot is very good at it. Um, we're also driving on the freeway, so we drive from zero to 65 miles an hour, including on-ramps and off-ramps and merging. We can drive in tunnels. We can drive without GPS. We're also driving on really steep and narrow roads. So here you see one of the more difficult roads in San Francisco with very little room to navigate between cars, doing this totally autonomously. Here's a really crowded right turn. Again, tracking hundreds of dynamic agents at the very same time. So really cool stuff. Uh, team's working really hard. Uh, if this sounds cool to you, let us know at talentandzooks.com. We're about 600 people, over 100 PhDs, uh, and we're a Stanford spin-off. So we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Eric. I'm a student here working with David Lentink, and today we're presenting PigeonBot, which is a biohybrid flying feathered morphing wing robot um, that we use to study how birds coordinate the motion of their feathers when they morph their wings, and also how they can use this wing morphing to uh, maneuver in flight. So uh, the wing has four independently controlled wing joints that under-actuate 40 bird feathers. Um, and this allows a wide configuration space of symmetric and asymmetric wing platforms um, that we have flight tested uh, in untethered uh, outdoor flight. Um, to learn more about the biomechanics that make this all happen, please check out my lab mate, Laura Matloff's poster, and she's gonna share her work now. Thank you. I'm Laura Matloff, like Eric introduced me. I'm also in David Lenting's lab here at Stanford University. Um, and so a lot of my work is looking at this bio-inspired robotic design. And the mechanism that uh, we have for this bio-inspired wing is not merely uh, bio-inspired, but really rooted in the biology. Um, and so I've taken these biomechanical measurements of the feathers and the bone within a morphing pigeon wing and discovered that there's a linear relationship between the feather angles of all the feathers and the wrist angle, which drives this underactuated design. Um, and so as Eric said, we put that into a bio-inspired and biohybrid wing, um, which really does morph uh, like a real pigeon wing. And we've tested this both in free flight on a robotic platform as well as different flow conditions um, within a wind tunnel. And to, see, to hear more, come by our poster. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Abbott from UC Berkeley um, as a member of the Embodied Dexterity Group. So adding um, effective tactile sensing modalities to end effectors remains a compelling challenge for the robotics field. And as Professor Stewart mentioned earlier, adding some suction flow um, to an, an underwater manipulator can enhance grasping and manipulation tasks. And our work is aiming to uh, increase the effectiveness of, of suction flow. Um, essentially, aiming to answer the question, can a sensor measuring the flow rate of suction flow act as a new method for tactile sensing uh, underwater? And so our findings thus far indicate that it absolutely can. Um, our results are showing positive indications that um, that such a sensor can remotely sense contact conditions at the fingertips, as well as being able to be tuned to contact angle um, as a function of the fingertip geometry. And finally, we're finding that we're actually able to measure certain material properties of objects grasped. If any of that sounds interesting, please talk to us further. Thank you. I'm Monica, also part of the Embodied Dexterity Group. We're working in collaboration with the California Academy of Sciences to develop a gripper for a small ROV to um, sample coral. Current one degree of freedom grippers are difficult to operate and uh, poor attachment to coral often leads to failure to, sample, to acquire a sample. Uh, so we're, uh, we're designing a spiny gripper to improve grasping capabilities. 
Um, so a jamming interaction occurs between the spine and coral, leading to a very firm hold. We're also looking into um, sound as a haptic sensor. So here is a spectrogram of a spine dragging across coral underwater. Um, come check out my poster. Good morning, I'm Sumit, and I'm a student with Marco Pavane at the Autonomous Systems Lab at Stanford here. And the problem that we tackle is motion planning with unknown dynamics, meaning that we first need to acquire a model from demonstrations. Now, a traditional regression algorithm would es estimate the model and generate new trajectories for the robot to follow, but there's no guarantee that the robot can actually follow these trajectories or even be stabilized with a feedback controller, since, th since there's no notion of controllability encoded within the learning algorithm. In contrast, we use tools from nonlinear control and convex optimization to formulate a st stabilizability constrained learning algorithm, which even for small data sets can generate high quality model estimates whose resulting trajectories, even those that venture out of the train distribution, are actually controllable. In particular, we significant, significantly outperform traditional regression techniques that can generate arbitrarily bad unstable trajectories, especially from models trained on small data sets. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrew, working, also working with Marco Pavoni in the Stanford Autonomous Systems Lab. So we're presenting GUSTO, which stands for Guaranteed Sequential Trajectory Optimization. Um, and the GUSTO framework uses sequential convex programming, or SCP. Um, we showed that it meets three key goals for robot trajectory optimization, high computational speed, strong theoretical guarantees, and generality. Oh, thank you, Joe. Um, so the GUSO framework is designed to, for the large class of dr drift control affine nonlinear dynamical systems, and it provides convergence and continuous time for both free and fixed final time problems, while also guaranteeing dynamic feasibility. And we show um, strong convergence in trajectories to at least a stationary point, which is stronger than the current state of the art. Um, one of the harder things for us to prove was strong convergence in the dual solution. This actually leads to a unique numerical feature where we can use our highly informative SCP dual solutions to warm start shooting methods, uh, which converge extremely fast. So computational-wise, our SCP-only framework is comparable to Trachop, which also uses SCP. Um, but with this shooting method acceleration, we've found speed increases of two to four times in some initial tests. So uh, we've released a code library and tried it on a number of robots. If you're interested in learning more, come see us at our poster. Hello, uh, my name is Nathan Bucky, and I work with Mark Mueller in the High Performance Robotics Lab. So I think Mark kind of stole my thunder on these videos a bit, but um, basically what we're interested in this project is flying in these difficult environments. So um, for example, hailstorms, high wind shear environments, and adversarial situations. So um, our solution to this is to change the dynamics of the vehicle. Specifically, we add additional angular momentum. So in the videos at the bottom, you see on the left, we have a normal quadcopter. So we, we've attached this momentum wheel to the bottom, and it's, it's not spinning on the left side. Whereas on the right, uh, by spinning the wheel, we've changed the dynamics in a way that allows us to reject these torque disturbances better. Um, so in this, in the, again, in the video we're, here, we're just dropping a steel ball. Um, this is to simulate a torque impulse disturbance. And we've shown that both experimentally, as, as I'm showing here, and also uh, theoretically, that this improves the disturbance of the rejection the disturbance rejection of the vehicle by adding this additional angular momentum. I'd love to talk to you more at the poster session. Uh, come find me outside. Thanks. Hi, my name is Xiang Yu Wu from the High Performance Robotics Lab at UC Berkeley. In this work, we propose a method that allows a uh, quadcopter to find the velocity which maximizes its flight time or um, flight distance. The proposed method is based on extreme city control, does not require any power consumption model of the vehicle, can be executed online, and can uh, adapt to unknown disturbances. In experiments, we show uh, the proposed method's ability to find the optimal range velocity under unknown disturbances, and we also show that Hovering is not actually the most energy efficient loitering uh, strategy. This work uh, may be especially useful in applications where a quadcopter needs to carry an unknown payload and travel a long distance. Thank you. Hi, 
everyone. I am Erdem Beek from Stanford, and this is a joint work with Dorsa Sari. So the goal uh, of this project is to learn the preference of a user uh, on a specific task, but humans are not really good at uh, quantifying their preferences, so we do not explicitly have access to their reward functions. We instead use pairwise comparisons, and these are easier to collect from humans. We develop a batch active learning algorithm that leverages these comparisons to learn the reward function. Our motivation is that uh, learning from comparisons can require too many samples. So we take an active learning approach to query the most informative comparison, but every query generation can take too much time. So we develop efficient batch active learning algorithms that generate a batch of queries altogether using a set of techniques such as clustering based methods or successive elimination to balance between informativeness and query generation times. Thanks. Uh, hi, so I'm Mene, and this is work done with Mengxi and Dorsa. So human-robot teams are becoming a reality, whether it be in search and rescue missions or on shared roads. Leadership is an inherent part of teams, and if you look at teams of humans, they are able to flexibly give or take up leading and following roles. So our goal is to enable a robot to model this dynamic, latent leadership structure and use that information to influence the team of humans in order to reach some desired outcome. We model leading and following structures as a directed graph where the nodes represent agents and directed edges represent, for example, that agent B is following agent A. We learn this graph in a scalable manner using a combination of supervised learning and graph theoretic algorithms. We are then working to create a robot policy that can influence this graph to, to reach a desired outcome. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Jake Skanga and I work with David Camarillo here at Stanford. He's giving a talk on this work at 11.20 today and I'm showing just one of three deep learning approaches we've developed to localize a soft surgical robot in the airways of the lung. This one shown here is just a pretty simple classification network where we're classifying the visible airways and identifying where the center lines of the airways are. The goal of our work is to localize the surgical robot well enough that we can integrate it with the motion controller we developed before to have closed loop control in the airways of the lung. Thank you. Hello everybody, I am Hossein Ahid Elizadeh from Camarillo Lab, Stanford. Our work is about controlling the orientation of the cells for in vitro fertilization. The current manual positioning of the cells is inconsistent, time consuming, and has low efficiency. We have developed a system that can be easily integrated into IVF microscopes and automatically control the orientation of the cells. Our system it uses an uh, image processing algorithm to detect the orientation of the cells, then apply a vibration to the system and control the frequency of the vibration to control the orientation. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Craig Schindler. I'm a graduate student at UC Berkeley. And the goal of this work is to create uh, autonomous millimeter and centimeter scale jumping micro robots fabricated from silicon on insulator wafers. The robot that you see on the top left is the first version of, uh, first version of our robot. Uh, it contains electrostatic intramural motors and energy storing springs both built in the silicon and insulator uh, layer. The latest version of our robot, which you see on the bottom left, contains electrostatic motors built into the silicon and insulator layer, but uh, also contains um, energy storing springs built into the silicon substrate itself, which allows for much higher energy storage. Uh, you can see these, these substrate springs jumping on the right-hand side. Uh, and in the future, we plan to integrate a microprocessor, a transceiver, solar cells, and many other sensors for full autonomy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tae myung -ha. I am going to present two sensing methods for measuring contact of thin film gecko adhesives. In our lab, we have been working on gecko-inspired dry adhesives, and using this, we demonstrated a thin film gripper that can grasp large objects, even in a microgravity. To measure the adhesion, we need to measure the uh, microcontext because of its working principle. 
So for the first contact sensing method, we used uh, acoustic wave that is transmitted and received by the piezoelectric transducers. And measuring the sensor level and the slope changes, we could detect, we could predict the impending slip value. For the second method, we made a capacitive sensor that measures the dielectric constant change of bent wedges. And using this, we could monitor the contact changes in a different grasping phases. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Avi Singh. I'm from Sergey Levin's group at UC Berkeley, and this is joint work with Chelsea Finn and Annie Shi. So uh, reinforcement learning methods require reward functions, but reward functions are hard to specify in a variety of scenarios. For example, when you have visual observations and unknown object positions. Uh, and an, an alternative to reward functions is to inf instead infer uh, the objective for a task from a few image examples of the goal through the use of success uh, classifiers uh, and using the predictive probability as the reward function. Uh, but learning a success classifier from scratch for every new task can be a fairly data hungry process. In order to overcome this issue, we introduced the few shot objective learning problem, uh, wherein we meta train over a large number of training tasks, which allows us to infer the objective quickly at test time. Uh, we conduct experiments on a number of different domains involving object manipulation and navigation, and our method is able to synthesize some interesting behaviors given only a few examples of the goal. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tianhe Yu. I, today I'm going to present one shot hierarchical imitation learning. This is joint work with Peter Bill, Sergey Levin, and Charles Fin. The goal of this work is to learn to perform temporal extended tasks from raw pixels by watching a single video of a human. The idea of this work is to segment a video of human demonstration into primitives and learn to perform and compose each predicted primitive. Our approach is that based on demonstrations of primitive skills, we apply meta learning to learning how to learn and compose uh, each primitive into multi stage tasks. Next, I show some results. First, uh, we show a video of human demonstration where the human places the bread into a container and push the container to the right. After seeing this demonstration, the robot is able to perform the same compound skill in a slightly different setting where the two containers are shuffled. As you can see, the robot is able to perform this compound skill quite nicely. And please come to our poster for more details. Thanks. Hi all, I'm Palak from Berkeley from the Hybrid Systems Lab. As a means to generate small aerial vehicles, the goal is to mimic insect wing trajectories which are marked by high wing strokes and equally high wing pitch. The smallest known vehicles known to do so are in the 100 milligram scale and uh, have 15 mm wing length. We make the first sub milligram biomimetic vehicle uh, at the same scale as a fruit fly and weighing less than the wings of prior works. The motion, the large motion is generated using a, a resonant mode shape of a compliant mechanism and the mechanical work is produced using a magnet coil system. This is the slow motion kinematics. The lift generated is estimated to be about half a milligrams. This operates at less than a volt. Uh, that's all. Thanks. See us at the poster session. Hi there. Uh, I'm David Friedovich Kyle. I'm a fourth year in the hybrid systems lab at Berkeley, uh, presenting some joint work with uh, a whole lot of other people. <laughs> Um, we're, we're talking about uh, probabilistically safe robot planning with confidence-based human predictions. And in this project, what we do is combine a, a new way to predict where, in particular, people, but more generally, uh, utility-driven agents are uh, going to, how they're going to move, um, and then combine that with a robust motion planner. Uh, so I'll just skip to the chase and see how it looks in hardware. So what's going on here is there's a quadrotor shown in the red circle that uh, correctly infers that its model of how the, the human pedestrian is, is walking is uh, incorrect as she avoids that uh, highlighted spot on the ground. And then I'll just 
play it real quick again. Uh, and on the right, you see a top-down view. So as the pedestrian avoids the unmodeled obstacle area, um, our predictions grow in entropy, and, uh, and the quadrant is correctly able to plan around. Thank you. Because of the smoke, we had to relocate the posters and uh, everything else in the blunt hall. It's just uh, uh, outside on the right, so we'll be inside. So uh, we'll come back in half an hour. Thank you. I'll go double verify that they will. Okay, thanks. Do you have a USB C and a HDMI? Uh, okay, I'm gonna need something else. <laughs> Hi, I'm just gonna test this out. This, this will stay up here, right? Yeah. Um, no audio. Okay, great. Hey, is everyone talking? Are you HDMI or Thunderbolt? HDMI. Whatever you prefer. Okay, I'll put this one back. I think most people are going to, well, I don't know what's going to be on those. Oh, I'm going to use HDMI. I, I can either, oh, sorry. either this, oh, this or is the, Oh, sorry, then use this HDMI.
right. Welcome, welcome back. So our first speaker is uh, Kushil Srinath from uh, Berkeley. Thanks, Marco. So it's uh, great to be here. Thanks for making it back from the break. So let me get started. I'm going to talk about agility and safety for dynamic robotics. Uh, so firstly, I want to thank all my students. They do all the hard work. I steal the credit. I want to thank my funding agencies. So let me dive uh, right in. I want to talk about urban aerial transportation as well as uh, some legged robots. So I wanted to show a picture of the Bay Bridge traffic, but uh, Dorso beat me to it. So here's a picture of 101 from like 60 years ago. There was traffic back then. This highway was called the Bloody Bay Shore. It hasn't changed much. So one of the things that I'm interested in is urban aerial transportation. So how do you transport packages from one location to another location over urban cities? I watch a lot of uh, cartoon movies. So one of the research goals we have is how do you replace all the balloons in this picture with aerial robots and transport a heavy payload? And you have a lot of safety through redundancy when you're transporting this payload over the urban city. So towards this, we have been working on uh, lots of different configurations of aerial robotics. So for today's talk, I'm going to talk about two of them, a quarter tool with a pulley where the length of the cable can change and a quarter tool where you have an offset in your suspension. So you can develop geometrical controllers for this to take the system through a bunch of windows where the size of the window changes. And since you have a cable that's actuated, you can not only track the position of the payload perfectly, but you can also go through these windows dynamically. So this works pretty well in simulations. So we're also looking at quadrotors where your suspension point is offset from the central mass of your quadrotor. So if you do not take this offset into account, you have a large error in your payload tracking, but if you do take this into account, you have almost perfect tracking. So this again works pretty well in simulation. So when you go to experiments, things begin to fail. So here's an example of three quadrotors trying to transport a cable suspended rigid body payload. So when you try experiments on this, there's a lot of 